Yeah, it's great to be here, and uh, I've spoken here many times, but I don't think ever on a Sunday morning, so it's great to be here, and particularly excited to continue on the series that you guys have been doing, Mission Possible. And uh, I've entitled my particular message this morning, Let Hope Rise, because I believe that the, the mission that God has for us as a, uh, as a church is that we are to be the bringers of hope to a, uh, a hopeless uh, world, that we are to be bringers of hope wherever there, there is no hope, that that is the mission that God has commissioned each and every one of us with, to be those bringers of hope. And um, I was reading a study um, that was done uh, just a few weeks ago, and uh, they were talking about uh, how there were, uh, they got these rats. It always seems to be rats or mice that get sort of the rough end of the stick. But uh, what they did was they, they put these rats into a, a barrel, and uh, the barrel was kind of half filled with water, and they were timing how long uh, the rats could actually swim for before they eventually succumbed to the environment that they were in and, and needed to, uh, to be rescued. And the first time that they did the experiment, what they did was the, uh, the container was totally sealed, so no light, no nothing could get in, and they timed it, and the rats could swim for about 20 minutes. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't even think I could swim for, for 20 minutes, but uh, these rats seem to be able to do that before they sort of uh, uh, gave up. And uh, then they did the same experiment again, but this time what they did was they, they poked a hole in, in the, the top of the, of the barrel that they had so that light could stream in and so that they could actually see which way was up and which way, if they were to be rescued, where the rescue could actually come from. And what they discovered with, with that, when they did the experiment again that time was that the rats could actually swim for three to four hours. And it got me thinking, you know, why was there this difference? What, what was the cause of the difference? And it got me thinking, what if there was some kind of, you know, crack team of, of rat-saving people, right? That they were on their own Mission Impossible, that they were just like, you know, the theme music was playing, dun, 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 and they're off on this mission. They hear that these rats are in this barrel, that they're drowning, and so they head off. But the only problem is that they're an hour away from reaching the rats and rescuing them. Once they get there, one group of rats would have been saved because they were swimming for three to four hours, but the other group would have perished. And you see, I believe that they would have perished not because they were physically unable, because we know that they were physically able to keep swimming much longer than what they did, but the reason that they perished was because they didn't have any hope. They didn't have the light shining in and, and streaming into their life, and I think that sometimes that is, for me, what church should really be all about. It's about people coming into a place and maybe you feel like that you've been in a bit of a rat race. Maybe you feel like that you've been in the darkness. Maybe you feel like you've, you're sort of struggling to, to survive, struggling to keep going on. But church should be a place where we come and we have a hole kind of, you know, punched into the roof of our lives and we can see the light of Jesus come streaming in, where we can see the hope of Jesus come flooding into our situation. But more than that, more than just the promise of hope, more than just uh, you know, light streaming in, that this message of hope that, that Jesus has for us is that there is a rescue team. There was a rescue team. There was a, a rescue plan that was mounted 2,000 years ago where Jesus left heaven and came to earth to rescue us, to, to reach out his hand and reach in and grab us and pull us to safety and to rescue us. And so as we go out from, from this place, we are actually called to speak that, that message of hope, that there is a rescue plan, that there is a secure hope in heaven because of what Jesus has done. That we don't just need to be fumbling around in the dark, stumbling around looking for, for where hope is coming from, when we can actually see that in and through Jesus and his message of hope, that we have access to a sure salvation this morning. And this is, for me, the aim of the local church. And for me, the local church is the only eternally indestructible force on the planet. 
I don't know whether you've thought about that before. Everything else is going to fade away. Heaven and earth is going to fade away. But the church of Jesus Christ is going to remain. It is the only eternally indestructible force on the planet. And we get to be a part of that. We get to be a part of of him bringing his hope to the world. And just recently, I got the opportunity to to travel with a a team from my church to, to Cambodia. And I got to see the difference that one church can make in a local community. If we can have that first picture up, thanks. So this is a street in Cambodia. And a few years ago, this was probably the worst street in Cambodia for human trafficking, for the trafficking of young children. Now on this street, you can see it's only just a a short street not very long, it's a, it's a dirt road. Here I am standing at almost one end of the street. You can see the other end of the street. And this short street operated 15 brothels selling children, up to 300 children in each one. Talk about a hopeless situation. Can you imagine if you were a child born in that town, born on that street, what kind of hope for a future would you have? when this is what is going on just in that area. But this situation was not hopeless because a local church found out about this and they decided to do something. They decided to punch a hole in the roof. They decided to let the light of Jesus come and shine in on that community. And they decided to to not just talk about it, they decided to actually do something. And so they did a fundraising campaign, they raised some funds and they actually purchased one of those brothels. And they turned it into a safe house for these kids. So the, very, the building was built for the purpose of exploiting kids, but they've turned it all around, and now that same building is used to protect children. And it got me thinking of this passage of Scripture where um, Joseph, after he was sold into slavery, speaks to his brothers. And he said this in, in Genesis Twenty, And I think that these words would be echoed by these people of Swipak. And my hope is, is that maybe today, if you've been in a tough situation, that these words would be echoed by you too, as you see your need for hope. It says, you planned something bad for me, but God produced something good from it. In order to save the lives of many people, just as he is doing today. So let me tell you what he is doing today in this community, because it didn't just stop there with that one. Now, that was back in 2009, and now when we visited there just three weeks ago, we were able to see how they have now purchased nine of those brothels. And they've turned those things, there's a a church in one, there's a school in one, here's a a picture of one of the, the school classrooms, you can see that this was a it used to be a room where it was originally, again, designed for the selling of children, and they've turned it into a, a classroom. So they run a school out of one. They, uh, they have um, sewing machines all set up in another, as you can see there, where they're making clothes. They're providing an income for the local people of that, that region. So three of these uh, buildings are now um, producing um, textiles and t-shirts and all different things. Um, Some of them are screen printing places. They've got jewelry making in one, so it's providing an income. And you can also see here, it's not a very good picture, sorry, but um, on the right there is they've turned one of them into a gym. And so what they're doing is they're taking the, the men of that town and they're training them and they're giving them jobs as bodyguards and security guards. So they're taking these men who were once predators of the kids of their community and turning them into protectors. And so today, when you go there, not one of those 15 brothels that were operating on that street is still open today. Every single one has been closed down. That is the power of the church when the church is done right, when people will actually stand up and do something. And for me... It reminded me of this uh, book that I read, maybe you've read it by Bill Harbour, it's called Holy Discontent. 
And in this book, Holy Discontent, it says that we all should have a discontent for the things that we see, the injustices that we see in the world. That we should be not okay with these things that are going on. When we hear about these things, that something should happen inside of us that will actually cause us to rise up and do something. And he says in that book that we all need to have what he calls a Popeye moment. Anyone watch Popeye as a, as a kid? Yep. My mum used to love me watching Popeye because I would always eat my spinach after that because I wanted to grow up and be big and strong, just like Popeye. But basically, Popeye, he was this chilled kind of sailor dude, and um, Brutus would come and he would like push his buttons. He would stir him up. And he would get to this place where he would get so frustrated with, with all the potting and all the, pro, uh, all the antagonizing that was going on that he would say this line, if we can have it up, he would say this, I've had all I can stand and I can't stand no more. Remember him saying that? And what Bill Hybels is saying to us is he's saying we all need to have this moment where we hear stories like the ones that I've just told you where we say, I, I can't stand it anymore. This is not okay. That we as the church need to rise up and actually do something. And that rather than just, you know, when we hear stuff like this and it makes us feel uncomfortable, it makes us feel, you know, not good inside and sometimes we just want to push that feeling down, don't we? We just want to kind of get rid of it. But I, I believe that the Word of God compels us to actually do something. That, that the reason that you're feeling that way is because God has designed you to actually stand up against those injustices. That, you know, oftentimes if we picture ourselves as those, you know, rats in that barrel trying to, trying to swim, that we, would, that we would see that the waters, the, the turbulent waters, the things that are trying to drown us, we just want them gone. We just want to push them down and so that the, the waters would be gone from underneath us. The things that are endangering us, the things that make us feel bad, the things that are maybe threatening our peace and our safety, we just want them gone. But what we need to realize is that if that water is gone, we're still actually going to be trapped in that empty barrel. And so many times I think people, they spend their whole lives just striving and, and trying to tread water and trying to, you know, get rid of those things and try to isolate themselves only to realize that they have isolated themselves so much that they're actually alone and that the fear that they have is actually what is keeping them hostage. The fear of stepping out, the fear of, of doing something that God is actually calling us to do. Rather than understanding that if we actually embrace some of those holy discontents, those, those fears and those things that, that rise up inside us that say that this is not okay, that as we allow more water to come into that area, that there can come a time where there would actually be so much water that, that you know, God is not going to let us sink, that he is going to cause us to float, and that there will come a time where, where hope will rise as that water rises to the point of overflow, and it will actually lead us up and out to our safety and to our freedom. So God doesn't want us just treading water for the rest of our lives. God doesn't just want us you know, to just isolate ourselves and keep ourselves in this little bubble where we're okay, even though the rest of the world is not. He wants us to get out there and do something. And maybe, just maybe, you will find the meaning and the purpose for your life as you start to embrace it and as you start to allow those waters to come in and flood your life. You may just find that that is actually the living water that provides you with the meaning and the purpose that you were always looking for in the first place. Because God has designed and created you for more. God has designed and created you with purpose. God has designed and created you as his carriers of hope to a hopeless and hurting world. Now maybe for you it's not Cambodia. I'm not here to try and get you to, to come with me as we go again. I'm not here to try and get you to give me money to go again I'm trying to tell you these stories so that you know and you understand that everyone has an opportunity to give and to do something. 
that even here in, this own, in your own local church, that there are opportunities for you to give and serve. I know for us, we've stolen one of your ideas that, that Peter Gillard came up with, that one in 10 program, that we're at next weekend at our church, we're running a, a one in 10 program where we're going out to the community and we're helping the people of our community that, that maybe can't help themselves, that can't get out and do their yard work. And you run one of those programs right here. So for you, if, if your Popeye moment comes as you drive past the precious people of your community and you see, well, this is not right, this is not okay, that these people that maybe can't get out and, and, and help themselves, it's not okay that they're left like that. And if that's you, and if you're feeling like that, then maybe see Peter and the one in 10 team and join that team. And if, you know, you, you look at, at children, you're hearing some of the stories of some of the kids that I might be talking about today, and for you, 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 you have this injustice rise up about, about kids and making sure that, that they're safe and that they're protected. Well, there's kids in, this, in your own community that need your love and care and support. And so I believe that um, you've started a Friday night kids program here that is reaching out to the community kids in this region. So I encourage you to, to see Shay and, and, and join that team if that's what is causing that holy discontent within your heart. Because it's not just overseas that this stuff is happening. That right here in Adelaide, that there, are, there is slavery going on right now. That we actually partner with an organization that just this month has rescued five people out of slavery from Adelaide. It's going on right here. If we would only open our eyes and see the hurt and the injustice, but then know that God has a plan and that you are part of his rescue plan to bring hope to the world. You see, it's not about just being good and doing church. It's about doing good and being the church. This is what we are called to. Martin Luther King had his own Popeye moment, his own time where he rose up against the injustice that he saw was facing his country. And many of you know the impact that this one man has had on, on his nation. But he said this, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. There are things that matter to the heart of God. There are things that matter to you. Can I encourage you, don't just become silent. Don't just try to push those things down. If something stirs your heart, if something causes you to say, this matters to me, then don't be silent. Don't be silent about those things. Use the voice that God has given you. Raise awareness. Get out and do something. He's given you a voice. He's given you hands to serve. He's given you feet to, to take you and carry you to the places that he wants you to go and the places where he wants you to serve. But you see, this whole idea that this mission is not impossible, that there is a mission that is possible for each and every one of you, that this idea of social justice and, and missions and, and getting out there and doing it is not supposed to be just a side issue to our faith. It's supposed to be central to what God is actually calling us to. And we can read that in James 1.27. It says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, of course, the Bible does say that we're not to neglect meeting together. And so it's great that you're all here in church today, but... Your mission does not finish when this service ends. Your mission begins when this service ends. As you go out and as you, you serve your community and as you do those things, that visiting orphans and widows is the essence of what God is actually calling us to do. Those in need in our community is basically what it's saying. And this picture that you see up here is my wife, Belinda. She's praying for a, a lady there when we were in uh, Cambodia. We're in her house there. This lady is 89 years of age. She is blind in one eye, so she can't work. She had 10 children. Nine of them were killed by the Khmer Rouge when they took power back in the 70s in Cambodia. 
Her husband was forced into slavery during that time, and in the process of his work as a slave, he also was killed. The house where we are in in this picture is up on stilts because she did not have enough money to to purchase a house or to buy land, so she built in a flood zone. And so even though her house is on stilts off the ground, it still floods periodically. And so at 89 years of age, she is swimming and she has to climb up onto her roof just to stay alive. But in spite of of all this, in spite of this, this darkness that would seem to be upon her life, there was a light of hope that came streaming in through her roof. You see, when she, she fled the, the Khmer Rouge, she was a, a refugee in her own country. And so she went to a refugee camp and there in the midst of the refugee camp, in the midst of her hurt and pain and in the, one of the darkest times in her life, someone told her about the love of Jesus. And so now because someone had told her about the love of Jesus and because she has received this message of hope and life that each of you have received, she has now said, well, I don't have a lot, but the little that I do have... I'm going to use to bless others. And so this young orphan that is sitting in her lap is one of 12 kids that she looks after. So you may think, there's not a lot that I can do. But just like this lady, take the little that you have and bring it before Almighty God because God can do miraculous things with your little thing. God can do big things with your little thing, no matter how little it may be. Because this is how we change the world, one person at a time. That to to those 12 kids, they would have no hope if it wasn't for this lady. But because she had hope stream into her life, now she is bringing hope to so many others in her community. Now, it's a harsh fact about Cambodia that more than two and a half million people in the country live on less than $1.20 a day. And that the sale of virgin girls pays between $800 and $4,000. So can you see the predicament that some families are in, that they might have five children and their income is $1.20 a day? How do you feed those five kids? What happens when you're confronted with the choice between slowly watching those five kids starve to death or selling one to feed the others? You can see the predicament that people are placed in because of the poverty and because of the things that have taken place in Cambodia. But also, this statistic is very disturbing to me, that 70% of all children that live in the slum areas have been approached by tourists for sex. And those tourists are coming from Australia. You have a voice. It may seem like mission impossible, but it is mission possible. It is what God is calling each and every one of us to in our own context. James Hudson Taylor says this. I love this quote. It says, There are three stages to every great work of God. First, it is impossible. Then it's difficult. And then it's done. We can't just stop at the impossible. That if we go to God and if we go empowered by God and empowered by the Holy Spirit, that there is a mission that may in the outset seem impossible, but as we go one by one, as we go and just save the one, all of a sudden, it gets done. We have this this job, this task, this task that is before us is the colonization of earth. That heaven is supposed to come and invade earth. That this was the mission that Jesus came for. It's project colonization. That he wants us to come and impact our world with this message of hope of heaven. 
to a broken and hurting world. And he does it one at a time, and he does it through you. You see, this was our second trip to Cambodia. The first time that we went, we saw some of the, the needs, and so um, we wanted to, to help in, in some way. And so if we can have the, the next slide up. Thanks, Gannett. So this is, this is Chai. He was a man that we met the first time that we went. And this is a, a tuk-tuk that, uh, that uh, we bought for him, that we had. So it's a little motorbike and a little carriage on the back, and that is now his income. You see, his daughter had been abducted. She was taken from their home. Now, not only do parents um, sometimes sell their children, but sometimes they're abducted. You see, only about 20% of the people in Cambodia have access to a toilet. So sometimes there is one toilet for an entire community of, of thousands of people, and it's in a particular area. And so... Kids are obviously vulnerable. If they get up in the middle of the night, two or three o'clock in the morning, and they need to go to the toilet, they have to walk to this one particular place. And the predators know that, and so they wait, and they take them as they go to the toilet in the night. So this girl was taken and abducted, forced into um, to prostitution, in, in, into sex trafficking. But thankfully, she was rescued out of that by She Rescue, the organization that we were there with. She was put through the, the program, she was given an education, she had counsellors come and, and minister to her for the, the hurt and pain of what she had experienced. But then there was a time where she was ready to, to, to go home, to re-enter her community. But of course, the community was not safe. Her parents knew this, so they decided, well, we love our daughter, we'll do anything for her, so they sold he had a tuk-tuk before, that was his income, that was his business, but he sold it and he sold their house so that they could buy a, a more stable house with a toilet in a better community so that they could get their precious daughter back. So they did that, but then of course they had no income. They didn't even have their dollar twenty a day to live off of. So we decided that, that we would purchase this tuk-tuk for him. So we had this, this made um, especially for him and upon our return to Cambodia, he discovered that, that we were there. And even though we'd given it anonymously, he somehow knew that it was, that it was us. So he came and he was so overjoyed, you know, with tears in his eyes. He was just so thankful for what we had done to, to bless his family. That his family were now all back together, they were safe. And they had a continuing income that he could support his family. All for the cost of about, I can't even remember, $1,500, $1,800 set this family up for the rest of their life. But he was there, he was so happy, he was so overjoyed that he said to us, I'm going to take you for a ride in this tuk-tuk, anywhere you want to go in Cambodia. Well, we, we didn't really know too many hot spots in Cambodia, places to go. But I, I had checked my, my phone that day and I have a, a member of my congregation back in Murray Bridge, and she was originally American. She was back in America, visiting home, visiting family. And while she was there, she discovered that her previous senior pastor, who she went back to visit, was actually in Cambodia, running a conference at that same time. So we were there, if we could have the next slide up. And so we had a, just go back one. So this is us in their home. So we had hired a translator. Obviously, my Khmer is not that great, so I needed a translator. So I said to the translator, can, we, can he take us to this conference? Now, Cambodia is 98% Buddhist, and we just hired this guy as a translator. It turns out that even though, against all the odds, he was actually a Christian, he was actually an orphan himself, and the church had taken him in and taught him how to speak English. And this was his first paying job, was coming and translating for us. And he said, I know exactly where that conference is. That is the church that adopted me and took me in, and I'm actually due to be serving at that very conference that you want to go to. I can show you exactly where it is, and then I can go and uh, serve where I need to serve in the conference. So we said, fantastic. 
So he said to Chai, bring your wife along because you're going to need to take us home. And, you know, why don't you just come in and listen to the service with us, come to the conference with us? So he says, you know, okay, well, I don't know what he said because it was in Khmer, but they (laughs) obviously agreed and we we all kind of headed off to where we were going. Chai and his wife sat with us. We, we listened to the conference. It was amazing. They had a time at the end where there was uh, an altar call and, and people started to go down the front. And we didn't have our translator anymore, so we were kind of not knowing what to do, but Chai wanted to go down the front, so we went down the front with him. And who was there to pray for him but the very translator? That was his act of service. And so he got to lead him in a prayer of receiving Jesus. And I just think, what an amazing story of how God is at work. Here's this lady from my congregation telling me about this, and here's Chai, and here's all these different things, all these different events and and circumstances and situations all lined up to bring hope and life to one precious family. And I thought, if, if God did that for them, then he can also do it for you. But more than just that, more than understanding that God would move heaven and earth, that God would actually cause two people to travel from little old Murray Bridge in South Australia all the way to Cambodia to bring life and hope to one family. But that God would also not only use, not only wants that to happen in our lives, but he wants us to be used to do it in the lives of other people. That you may actually be the answer to prayers that other people are praying. I don't know whether you've ever considered that before, that you may be the, the very answer to the prayers that maybe even the person you're sitting next to is praying. Now, of course, not all of the stories have happy endings like that just yet. We uh, spent a couple of nights going undercover in the red light district, And that was a place where there really doesn't seem to be any hope, a dark place. In fact, as we're standing there and as we're ministering to the to the to the pimps and the prostitutes, we can we could look over at the place that we were in. I don't even know what that was called, but across the street, the uh, other club where um, stuff was going on was literally called the Heart of Darkness. That was the name of the club, the Heart of Darkness. Even seeing that just sent shivers down my spine. But we were there, we're, we're ministering, we're talking to, to these um, precious ladies and I'm sort of saying, do you have any vision of how you can get out of the, here? Do you have any hope, any, any dreams, any aspirations for your future? What would you want to do? And she said, if, if I had a dream, if I had a vision, if I had any stream of light coming into my world at all, if I, if I knew where help was coming from, or I had any other idea, if, if anything could come into my head apart from this, there's no way that I would be here. That this was a hopeless situation that she had found herself in. And I was speaking to a, another lady and I said, well, do you feel safe? Here, Do you feel safe doing this job that you're doing? And she said, yes, I'm very safe. And I said, do any of the men that come to visit you, do they hit you? She said, yes, they hit me all the time. Every night I get beaten up. And she showed me underneath her makeup the, the cuts and the bruises all over her body. She was bruised and battered. So I asked again, well, how can you say that you are, that you are safe? And she could see the hurt and pain in my eyes as she's explaining what would happen to her night after night. And it actually confused her because, you see, no one had ever looked at her like that before. You see, she had been told that she was of such little worth, that that is how she saw herself that because no one had ever placed value on her, and I'm sure you've experienced this yourself, that if, if constantly you're in, a, in an environment, in a place where no one places value on you, all of a sudden you start to believe that it's true. 
all of a sudden you accept that as who you are and this is your lot in life. But as I started to explain to her while we were there, a stream of light started to shine in onto her life. You see, night after night, she'd been told that she was of such little worth. In fact, the, the men would, would just nominate how much they would want to pay. She'd put her worth in the hands of other men. And in some places, it's printed on the receipt. When the men would go to leave, it's just printed on there as an item, just like everything else. Five beers, four dollars. Two bags of chips, three dollars. Girl, two dollars. That was what she thought that she was worth. That was what people told her night after night she was worth. But there was a new message, there was a new hope that was coming into her life because as she looked into my eyes, I believe that she wasn't just seeing the hurt and pain that I was feeling for her. I believe that she was looking into the face of Jesus as I looked upon her with love and dignity and respect. And as I tried to share, I'm not here to buy you. I'm here to love you. I'm not here to, to pull you down. I'm here because I want to tell you about Jesus and his great love for you. And even in the midst of that dark place, that darkest of dark places, where all hope seemed to have <laughs> had been lost, and even though she couldn't speak English very well, and even though I could not speak Khmer at all, somehow just that look as I was looking upon her face, she was able to look back at me and say, I understand. I understand. You see, I, I didn't explain to her perfect theology. I didn't explain to her the substitutionary sacrifice of how Jesus died to take her sins. I didn't explain any of that. All I did was I stood there and I looked at her with dignity and honor and respect. And that was enough for her to say, I understand. So this morning, if you're sitting here and you're thinking, I can't do that, I, I, don't know. I don't know the right words to say, I don't know how to speak, I don't know how to communicate, I don't know how to love this broken and hurting world, well, all you have to do sometimes is stand there and look at people. Yes. All you have to do is stand there and give them the dignity and the honor of respect of listening to their story, just hearing it, letting it see, don't close your eyes, don't look away, don't turn your back on this broken and hurting world. Because sometimes that is enough to let hope rise in the life of one individual and for a broken, hurting world to say, I understand. Now I understand this message of hope that's come through Jesus. I want to close by reading a passage of Scripture that I think sums up Everything that I've been communicating today is from 2 Corinthians 4, verses 6 to 9. God said, let light shine out of darkness. He made his light to shine in our hearts. His light gives us the light to know his glory. His glory is shown in the face of Jesus. All we have to do this morning is look upon the face of Jesus. That as we look into the eyes of Jesus, as we allow his love to penetrate deep within our hearts, I believe that hope will rise in us and we'll have one of those moments where we say, I can't stand it anymore that there is a broken, hurting world that has not heard this story and we'll want to go out and share it. That treasure is kept in these jars of clay. That lady was a jar of clay, but there was a treasure that lied deep within her. In the same way we have the treasure of the good news in these earthly bodies of ours. That every one of you this morning has this good news in your body. You have this light of hope 
that is shining inside of you. We are pushed hard from all sides, but we are not beaten down. We are bewildered. But that doesn't make us lose hope. Don't lose hope this morning. Others make us suffer. Just as this lady had suffered, just as this other girl had suffered. But God does not desert us. If you are suffering this morning, if you are in that dark place this morning, know that even in the midst of that dark place, God has not deserted you. We are knocked down, but we are not knocked out. You see, we live in a world that is starved of love, starved of hope. A world that is trying to to swim and trying to make it. But this morning we have heard that that doesn't just take place overseas, that it is taking place in the very row that you are sitting in right here in church today. It may be happening in your heart, but don't lose hope and don't lose heart because there is a rescue team that is on its way. His name is Jesus and he has called us as a local church to bring that message of salvation and hope to this lost and broken world. It is not a mission impossible. It is mission possible because we have the Holy Spirit living and dwelling inside us. We have everything that we need and sometimes all that the world needs is just a look, just to gaze upon the face of Jesus and they'll be changed as the light of hope streams in on even those darkest of situations. Let's pray together.